You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Welcome to the Foundry Church. As we dive in today on our series on Luke, we're going to talk about this idea of misjudging something and causing you to miss out. Causing you to miss out on some of the good things, uh, all of the good things that God has planned for your life and coming to him on his terms, not ours. So today, uh, really one of the best ways to look at misjudging something and, and your misjudgment causing you to miss out is uh, an experience that I've had with Justin, our, our worship leader here at Foundry, Maine, where, um, where Justin has a lot of anxiety about driving in Chicago. And he had a couple bad experiences. And if you know Justin, if he has a bad experience with food, he'll never go there again. He swears they're out to poison him. And it's, it's awesome. Like, there's a restaurant. He's like, never again. And then, um, and then with Chicago, like there was one time where he went to a concert or something, and, and he got on the wrong train, went on the red line to the very end late at night, and they're like, Sorry, this is the last train, so he had to walk across Chicago, and he thought he was going to die. And then um, when he drives there, he, he's almost run people over because they're pedestrians. And, and, you know, there's just not that many pedestrians in, in downtown Zeeland or, or Holland. So Justin, he's very anxious um, about the, the craziness, especially the driving. The honking really gets to him and, and rattles him badly. I can hear him just screaming, my word, and then, like, driving like, like a madman. I love how for Justin, he was terrified of going into Chicago. One, there was a time where we as a staff went to a church in Dyer, Indiana, Faith Dyer, and we were talking with them as a staff, and then we decided, you know what, we're like 30 miles from Chicago. Let's all go eat at the Cheesecake Factory, because <laughs> it's Cheesecake Factory. It's a place dedicated to cheesecake. I need not say more. So um, we decided to go in there, and we, Eric Bazan and I had said, you know, we should probably just throw Justin in the trunk and take him in like, you know, we've captured him because he would be so anxious about it. But when we got there, the ladies were like, we're going to do a little shopping because our reservation was a ways out. And the guys were like, oh, we've heard about a couple of cool places. And we started wandering the streets. We go to this ancient pub called Patty's, and we're like, this is so awesome. And we just had this great time. We we drove in and out on the Stevens Parkway, and it was like lickety split, and it removed for him the sense of anxiety that things would go wrong. It was actually a really good time. His misjudgment of going to Chicago caused him to miss out on some of the good things that go on there, right? Some of the really fun things. So when, when we talk about misjudging, we want to look at Luke chapter 7 and engage the, the text and, and the life of what God's doing in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, for the benefit of people being healed of their sin, their sin removed and forgiven, to be in relationship with God. We see in Luke 7 a few different things. We have a centurion. Um, if you read your devotions this week, which I encourage you to keep doing because in the devotions, they really unpack this story well. The story of the centurion, the story of the widow's son is also in there. And what Jesus did with her, we get to, um, we get to see John the Baptist, and we'll talk about him a little bit and, and why he was called the Baptist, John the Baptist. Like in the United States, our biggest denomination in Christianity is the Southern Baptist Convention. They're named after the ministry of John the Baptist, who did the, um, he prepared people, he prepared the way for people to come to Christ, and he had a baptism, baptized into repentance of sin, which repentance means not just to feel bad about your sin, but it means to actually physically turn and walk away. If sin's here, you're headed that way. Repentance was a stopping of a behavior. This is what it says in Luke chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. During the high priesthood of Anna and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan River, and he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This would have been revolutionary and brand new. It would have been something just, just completely out of what was known in Jewish culture. And then we find ourselves diving into the text we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 7, 18 to 23. It says this, John the Baptist, his disciples told him 
about all of the things that Jesus was doing. Calling two of them, John sent them to the Lord Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, these are John the Baptist's disciples, the men following him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect another, someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers of John, go back and report this to John. Report what you have seen and report what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who, with, who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news, euangelion, is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. Which I think Jesus is encouraging John in this situation to stay sure-footed on what he knows to be true. Even though John's in an extreme circumstance right now in prison, Jesus is encouraging him. Stay true to what you know. Keep your feet on the ground because Jesus knows that for many in Israel and over time through the last two millennia, right up to the church, he will be a stumbling block. People will misjudge him. So, so when we ask, what did Jesus mean in verse 23 there where he says, you know, the, the comment that he makes to us about um, blessed is anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. I think it was talking about the way Jesus' way didn't settle well with the religious elite. We've talked about the religious elite a lot, and we need to have some fun and recognize that the religious elite are just lame. They are such joy killers. They come in, and they just kind of rough you up with this spirituality of shame and disgrace and legalism. And Jesus knew that um, his way of approaching God as father, this intimate closeness, would not settle well with religious people. They liked rules and structures that elevated themselves. They didn't like how Jesus ate. Like, have you ever had somebody who you don't like and they're chewing next to you and they're like, and you're like, I would like to choke you. You just get so mad, right? I don't know about you, but there's times where people are chewing, like especially on an airplane. Oh, my word. And you're like, I'm going to open the exit door and just, thump, you know, and push them out and let them glide down. Because you think to yourself, I can't take it. The religious elite didn't like how Jesus ate. They didn't like who he ate with. They didn't like that he chose to heal people on the Sabbath. Pastor Eric uh, Scrotenborg last week did such a good job of explaining what that means. They didn't like the way he wouldn't do the customary religious washings before he ate a meal. And even worse, they hated that his disciples didn't do the religious fasting, the, the removal of food from their, from their lives for periods of time that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had put in place. They didn't follow their rules. They hated it. His disciples, man, the religious elite really didn't like them. They couldn't stand the disciples of Christ. So Jesus chose to surround himself, and this is comforting at least to me and hopefully to you, but Jesus chose to surround himself with the unimportant, the regular Joes of this world. The sick, everybody who needed to be healed came to Jesus. And he chose them over the religious elite. He chose people the religious elite would have thought were the losers. Everything Jesus did became a stumbling block to the religious elite. Why? I think the important question is why. And how do we, um, well, let's look further into this passage. All the people, in Luke 7, 29, all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. Do you get that? All the people who heard Jesus' words acknowledged that God was right because of their baptism of repentance. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purposes for themselves because they had not been baptized they had not gone through repentance. Repentance is really a linchpin in our faith and our understanding. They had not repented of their sin. They had not come to John, repented of their sin, and been given forgiveness. 
They hadn't experienced forgiveness. As a result, they only judged Jesus. They only judged him. They didn't listen. They were constantly analyzing him and breaking it down. And they had done the same thing to John. Jesus said that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the the lawyers, that they were like spoiled brats. There's a scripture that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 7, 32 to 35, where he says this. They, speaking of the Pharisees and Sadducees, are like little children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't cry. And then he goes on. Now get this, and this is such an interesting way that Jesus kind of shows their hypocrisy. He says, for John the Baptist came neither eating bread or drinking wine. Remember, John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. He wore a camel skin coat and a leather belt. He ate grasshoppers, locusts, and um, honey, wild honey. That's all he ate. So he ate bugs, and he got stung when he wanted something sweet. That's what John ate. So he didn't eat bread. He didn't drink wine. And Jesus says, and you say that he is possessed of a demon. You say that he's possessed of a demon. But the Son of Man, Jesus now speaking of himself, came and he was eating and drinking. And you say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and and sinners. And and no matter what you do, they, they judge you. So listen to how Jesus ends this. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. Wisdom is proved right. And what Jesus is saying is God's wisdom is about to, de- de- like, not denounce, but it's about to destroy your concept of how your judgment works on people. It's about to upend it because Jesus knows that people will follow in the path of grace through the repentance of sin. He knows that they will come to him and be transformed by him Because they walked away from their sins, having been forgiven. Do you see what the Pharisees did in this, what Jesus said? They used judgment to ignore God when it came to John. They criticized and ignored John because he was kind of weird. He lived in the desert eating bugs and honey and baptizing a baptism of repentance. So they didn't have to listen to him because they criticized and ignored him because he was odd. He was weird. He was outside their religious norm. But in the same way, when Jesus came, and lived totally different, almost a polar opposite life, what happens? They judged him in order to have an excuse not to obey. They were like, yeah, he's just a party animal. He eats and drinks all the time. We don't have to listen to him. Look at him. He has no self-control. They used their judgment to, to kind of, well, they used it and they weaponized religion to exalt themselves and put down what God was truly doing. The InterVarsity Press has a commentary on this scripture, and it is so very good. It says this, legalism or rule following often takes neutral issues based on style and tries to turn them into substance. It takes neutral issues based on style and tries to turn them into substance. I love that. I love that. When you take something of style and turn it into substance, it doesn't really, it's not satisfying. It's like this. You know, when you have a slice of uh, pumpkin pie, which I know we've gone from cheesecake to pumpkin pie, but it's me, right? This is just how I roll. Um, You take a piece of pumpkin pie, looks nice, kind of, you know, I'm colorblind, so it's kind of brown to me. I think it's brown to everybody else. And um, you take what? You put a little dollop of Cool Whip on top. And it's like a little Santa hat for it. It looks so good. And you're like, oh, man, I want all of that. And you like it, right? But if you just sit and eat Cool Whip, you're going to get sick because there's no substance. There's all this hollow kind of sugary, sappy, oily sweetness with no substance to it. And when you look at this, legalism is often like a hollow, um, just void version of of faith that doesn't have any dependence on God. It only loves the rules, and it tries to make rules into the relationship we're supposed to have with God, which is a lie, and it's not true. When God, when Jesus speaks of the wisdom of God in this, that wisdom will be proved right by all her children, he means that God's wisdom is revealed in those who respond obediently to his call. 
And I think that's so important. Wisdom is revealed in us not sitting back and judging everyone else, but in responding to the call of God on his terms, not ours. We say it this way at the Foundry Church. If you're sinful, if you're broken, if your life is a wreck, come here. Come meet God on his terms, not ours. You don't have to come here perfect. Come here and meet God on his terms. Let him convict you of sin and call you to himself. How gracious is Jesus that he does that for us. I know this. God often acts in surprising ways. He doesn't do things in the way that we would like. He doesn't always provide in ways that we would prefer. But in the same way, his usual path is often lined by people who have doubts about what you're doing. You can't do it that way. No one's ever done it that way before. That's not how we used to do it. All these things kind of equal out to people rejecting God because they don't like his methods. And they miss the substance of what repentance does in not only their eternal life, but their present life. In addition, Jesus warns that others are not interested in seeing God's work, but they are simply want to control how God does things. Oh, man, right? How true is that? I'm not a super bad control freak. I'm just a super, super bad control freak, personally. Like, I don't like to ride with other drivers because I'm better. I would rather be in the cockpit with the pilot flying the plane, even though when it comes to avionics, I know bubkis, right? I'm not good, but I would, I'm a little bit of a control freak. My wife would be like, you're kind of being controlling. You know, I'm like, I know, Eric, I can't break it, you know, but you need to listen to me. I have a struggle with this. But when we look at this, sometimes we need to, to recognize we like to control the way God does things. We like to engineer faith so that we come to God on our terms, not his, and that's not how it works. God comes to us, as the the InterVarsity Press commentary says, he comes to us in surprising ways on his terms, not ours. The call is not to be offended by the one he sends or how he brings his plan to pass in your life. We will appreciate his plan when we understand this thing called the love ratio. Jesus takes their hypocrisy and duality of, of like, oh, we don't like John, we don't like Jesus, and he flips it on, there, on, on its head when he goes into this idea, the understanding of the love ratio, how much love someone will respond with when grace is given to them. The amount we love God is directly related to the amount that we have repented and been forgiven of sin. The amount we love God is directly connected to the amount that we have repented and been forgiven of sin. I want to tell you a story out of John or out of Luke chapter 7. It's verses 36 to 50 and we're just going to talk about it. You can read the story and make sure you catch all the details, but it's the story of a sinful woman. A sinful woman. I want to paint a picture with you. Imagine with me being at a really nice dinner party. But it's a little bit of an, a different dinner party for us. At this dinner party, you kind of lay forward your plates in front of you and you lay forward with your feet behind you and everybody's facing in and their food's right there. And then the people who didn't get invited to sit at the table are standing around the room watching you eat. It's kind of creepy. I don't know if I could do it. I'd be like, do you want some chicken? You know, it'd just be weird. But um, imagine this, Jesus is laying there. And all these religious leaders, he was invited to the house of a Pharisee named Simon, and he was invited there, and he went for dinner, and all these people are standing, and a sinful woman heard that Jesus Christ would be at this Pharisee's house, and so she came to the house. And she stood back behind Jesus where he was, and she wept while he ate and talked with the religious elite. She wept to the point where her tears ran off her face, landed on the feet of Christ, and literally the quantity of her tears began to wash his feet. She, seeing her tears on his feet, took her hair and dried them off. Then she took a bottle, an alabaster jar of spikenard, which for us would be like... um, you know, the nicest bottle of Ralph Lauren or, or whatever kind of a perfume or cologne you really like. It would be like this amazing, expensive bottle of, of ointment, and she anointed his feet with it. She poured it over him. The fragrance filled the room. And then we find 
that the Pharisee who had invited Jesus to this dinner, it says this, he said to himself, you ever talk to yourself like anybody else? Sometimes I'll be like, well, I don't know if I like that. I just, you know, and then I realize you're, you're talking to yourself and I feel ashamed, but also like, yeah, maybe I need some help because I love talking to Eric. And um, this Pharisee's doing the same thing. He's talking to himself. If this man were a prophet, he says, he would know who is touching him. He would know that she is too sinful to be in this room. He would know not only is she too sinful to be in this room, she definitely shouldn't be touching him. He would know, if he were a prophet, what kind of woman this is. And I love this. Jesus answers him. Scripture in Luke says Jesus answered him. So he talks to himself, and then Jesus answers, which I think would have been awesomely awkward. And um, Jesus answers him and says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Two men owed money to a certain lender. One owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50. These were insurmountably big sums of money. One owes 500, the other 50. And the debt collector knows that neither of them have the money to pay him back. So he says to both of them, I forgive you of the debt you owe me. And then Jesus asks this question. And this is where we get to the love ratio. Which one would love him more? Simon, like a cornered cat, is kind of looking around and knows he only can give one answer. And he says, I suppose the one who would love him more is the one who had the larger debt. You have judged correctly, Jesus says. Then he turned towards the woman. He quit talking to the religious elite. And he said, and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? Not your laws. Do you see her? I came into your house, and when I came into your house, you did not give me water for my feet. Remember, if you do devotions, which I encourage you to do, you would have known that the washing of feet was a gift of service to your guest. It was a gift of service to your guest. And Jesus goes on to say, but she wet my feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss when I came into your house. Remember, Simon is watching this woman the whole time Jesus says this. He's saying, do you see this woman? Like, look at her. You didn't do for me what she did. You did not give me a kiss. Again, in devotions, you would know. If you read them, you would know a kiss would be similar to knuckles or a handshake for us in Western culture. It was a sign of greeting and a, and a kind of a nice formal welcome to a thing. And it still goes on in the Middle East. When I went to Lebanon in missions, I, I'll never forget the first guy who kissed me. I was like, oh, my word, that just happened. And I'd never done that. But it became very natural even for me over there. It was a sign of friendship and welcome. But this woman, Jesus says, from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has perfumed my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. Jesus is saying, she's the one who was forgiven much, but whoever forgives little loves little. And you can almost feel the roll of Simon's eyes. Oh, great. He got caught in one of Jesus' great teachings, and he was the one who loved little. Even though he put on the banquet, he didn't do the little things that showed he loved Jesus. And she lavishly poured out the little things, her own self for Jesus. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said, and I love this, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Her belief in Jesus Christ saved her. And the gospel has never changed its ethic. Our belief in Jesus Christ, his redemptive power and his call to redeem us out of our darkest, most broken selves is what saves us. We trust in Christ alone, his salvation work alone for us to have our sins forgiven. And we repent and we turn from them. He says, your sin, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Just, just hold the, the two ideas up here. Go in peace. What had she been doing for probably the last hour? 
She had been publicly sobbing and lamenting and grieving the thousands, hundreds of thousands of life choices she made and the reputation she had built for herself and the scorn she felt. She was grieving them publicly over the feet of Jesus and weeping. There was no peace to be found for her. She was just aware of her sin and her shame. And now meeting Christ, being forgiven, Jesus says this, go in peace. Bear no more of the sin and guilt and shame. Why? Because Christ dealt with it. She was forgiven much and she left in peace. I often think in this world we would have more peace if we would learn the art of repentance. And the art of repentance is rough and it is rugged, it is raw, it is laying bare before God that which we've done that separated us from him. So the judgment ratio versus the love ratio is an important kind of juxtaposition here. It's this, an unrepentant heart sees no sin in itself. It sees no sin. You look at the world and you're like, what a pile of losers. You guys don't have it together. You don't do the things that make you right with God. And we judge and we look at, right? A judgment ratio sees no sin in self. It just sees the faults of others and glories in our own behavior. It gives us the right to know exactly what we have to do as people to, um, it gives us the right to stand up in judgment and look at all the failures of others with never taking account of what goes on in our own heart. The judgment ratio sees no sin of its own. And a judgmental heart and a critical spirit will always end up, will always, without fail, will always end up missing what God is doing. A judgmental heart will end up missing what God is doing. So let me ask you this closing question. How much have you been forgiven for? How much have you been forgiven for? When, when I look back at my life, I think I learned to love more and more my Lord and Savior for all that he has redeemed out of me. I'm not saying I'm a monster. I'm just saying I'm sinful. I'm sinful in my, in my very nature. I, it's like I almost want to at times. I'm like, dang it. How do I fix that, right? I don't fix it. I repent of it. When God shows me an area of my life that is sinful and broken, I don't look out in the world to see some other person who's doing it worse and be like, well, at least I'm not like them. I have to take a moment, hold inward the pain and the reality, and lay before God all that separates me from him. And in doing that, I find myself blessed to love him more. I will say this. If you take account of how much you've been forgiven of, it shows in the way you love God in return. It shows how you live a life on mission and not a life obsessed with you and how bad the world is around you, but a life obsessed with obeying Jesus Christ who saved you from your worst self. In Jesus Christ, we recognize that we repent of our sin, we push it away, and we turn and we walk into life with him. I invite you to let your love show to this world. Let the world know how messed up you were and that you, like that sinful woman, have heard the words, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. Your sins are forgiven, go in peace, not by anything you did other than your faith in Christ. Take heart, my friends. If you don't have it all together, there is one who does. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And our love for him should be like the mountains. It should be something we can't deny. It's just there. Why? Because of the amazing amount of forgiveness and grace shown to us in Christ Jesus. Our sin has no grip any longer. Pray with me. God, we love you. We thank you. And we ask that you would come now and that you would give us your peace in this season. That you would be God over the crises in our hearts and minds, that we wouldn't find ourselves bowing the knee to our own indulgences, to the things we want to um, hold on to, but we would repent of our sin and turn away from anything that separates us from you. Thank you, God, for the baptism of repentance, the change of heart, and the opportunity to love you much to give all of us to you as you first gave all of yourself for us. Lord Jesus Christ, we, your church, respond just with a declaration. We love you.
In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.